is because of setup and feedback issues, there's two pictures of me. One of them is the one which is has a picture of me actually talking. The other one, which is the one you'll see if you're on the speaker, which is of me, just a snapshot. If you'd rather see my, my mouth moving, you can um, put that one on um, and you can pin, uh, pin that one. So I'm going to do a, a mixture of uh, um, uh, sort of pre-prepared things and not pre-prepared, and so I hope that will go more um, slowly than if I just write things uh, um, uh, write things out. So this is very much a um, theoretical talk, except for some things I'll show at the beginning for um, uh, for motivation, and I'll explain what I mean by the subtitle of what should not be um, what, what should not be surprising. So the general focus is going to be thinking of biology in the real sense of being high dimensions and the role of uh, um, randomness in uh, in modeling um, modeling. Um, can you know, can anyone see my screen now? I, I think your audio cut out for the last 15 yeah, minutes. Can you, can you hear me now? Uh, um, sorry, you can hear, you can hear me now. That's okay. Yes, no, it's okay. okay. For some reason, my, my computer one seems to have cut out. Okay, there it is. Sorry. Um, okay, sorry. So that I'm going to add um, ecology, and then the second and third lecture, I'm going to come to something which has already been introduced by many speakers, particularly by um, Stefano Alcina, of talking about the ecology in high dimensions in the sense of lots of Volterra models with large numbers of uh, species. And then I'm going to add a crucial part to that, um, which mostly raising questions about uh, um, the evolution on, uh, on that. Okay. So first, some of the um, uh, questions and motivations. So one of the um, key questions, why is there so much biological diversity? That's obviously a big um, general theme of this, uh, um, of this school. And, you know, the classic example of uh, um, beetles, um, there are various factors that contribute a lot to being able to um, have that. There are many different uh, niches. There are many different environments. And they geographically separated. What does that mean? That means they're not all competing with, uh, um, uh, with each other. Okay. Well, one of the things that's become clear in recent, uh, um, in recent years and becoming more and more clear the more people dig into it is that this, the diversity really goes down to much smaller um, scales. And I'm going to show one of the most um, dramatic uh, um, examples. So this is um, bacterial diversity within a species. And this is a species of Prochlorococcus. It's a cyanobacterium that dominates the photosynthesis in the tropical, um, uh, tropical oceans. And this is showing a tree of uh, from, uh, from 96 single cells in a very closely related uh, um, subclade of this uh, um, species. And there's a tremendous amount of diversity um, here and more, more data with more and more cells so that even from the same sample, and these are all taken from this, a few samples, even from the same sample, you see basically every cell is um, different um, genetically. And the time since the most common ancestor of this whole group is about a million years of the, um, of the, the smaller subclades of this is about um, uh, tens of thousand years. And these are all mixed together. They're free floating in the ocean. And in fact, they're mixed together over the whole ocean in about a hundred years or globally in about a thousand years. So this is extensive work of Penny Chisholm's group in this particular paper by Kashtan and, uh, um, um, and collaborators. Okay. So that's really um, dramatic. And that's something which we'd like to try to under understand. Surely there are not so many niches here that we can explain every possibility um, with a niche. So we'd like to ask about general questions about the, uh, um, um, the diversity. Okay, so a question we'll want to um, ask is whether or not sufficient organismic and environmental complexity in a general sense implies that one should expect this very kind of extensive diversity, which is enormous amounts of diversity all the way down to within uh, species, subspecies, and so on. And particularly in the most dramatic case where everything is mixing together and, uh, um, and competing. Okay, so that part I'm really going to talk about um, in the next two um, uh, next two lectures. Um, today I'm going to mostly start off with the other um, uh, the other part, which is about evolution in simple um, in simple environments. And so this is really intentional um, experiments done in the lab, um, where they're trying to make a very simple environment where there's no ecology 
everything is well mixed together. It's E. coli in low glucose, so the selective pressure from the low glucose. And this is a very long and beautiful experiment carried out by Rich, uh, um, Rich Lensky over, I guess, is now um, 30, uh, um, more than 30 years. Um, and what they find is that the E. coli um, evolved. There are many different genetic routes to higher fitness, even in this very simple environment the E. coli find many ways to do, um, uh, to do better. Now, when this experiment was started, there was essentially no um, DNA sequencing at all. And the kind of things that have become possible with this experiment in recent years, from the enormous advantages of the um, sequencing, have meant that one can go back and look at the fossil record and try to look at the fossil record and track the evolution that's, uh, um, um, that's gone on. Okay, so the particular um, thing I'm showing them um, here is the dynamics of the frequencies of the mutations. So this is the fractions of the population that uh, each mutation has and the mutations as they arise. And generally it's over here at this end, the mutations, a lot of mutations arise quickly and take over the population. So this is one line, this is one flask, there's always shaken, um, uh, so there's no geographical structure. He's done many different flasks in parallel and they all go somewhat uh, differently and some aspects quite differently. So these mutations come in quite fast. And then not surprisingly, it's sitting in a fixed, uh, a fixed environment. Gradually evolution starts slowing down. The evolutions come up more slowly. They tend to come up in groups. We have theoretical understanding of, uh, um, um, of that. Okay. But then after um, 10 years or so, something sort of funny happens. You get things coming up and coming back and back down again. And then some of those sort of swerve up and down over here. And there's a whole sense in here as to what's, uh, um, uh, what's going on. And it's clear that there's something in there, which is that they're interacting with each other. There's more than one type um, at a time. And so this is really indication of the development of a ecology, even in this very simple, uh, um, very simple conditions. And that's seen that the ecology that develops is different in the different, uh, um, in the different uh, um, uh, runs, of the, um, runs of the experiment. Okay. But then, and this is the bit that I want to just focus on now, then something happens um, um, later on. It seems to go back to being relatively um, relatively simple here with sweeps coming up, okay? But the weird thing that notices is that the sort of rate at which mutations come up and take over here is not that much different than what it was much uh, um, earlier on. It's slower than it was at the beginning, but it's not different much later, much later on. If you try to compete these with the original ancestor, they may be doing slightly better, but not much. And it's not clear if that can account for the rate at which they come up and how fast they come up, the, um, uh, how come up they there. So this is uh, um, a real question mark as to what's going on, on here. I'm not gonna claim to, un to really understand it, but I want to use that as a motivation. Okay, Because this raises the possibility of whether even in a constant environment, so in a constant environment here, whether or not the evolution can continue forever. Okay, so the question we want to ask here is whether evolution in a constant environment can continue forever without slowing. And I really want to put a can in here. Um, oh, sorry, I put a can at the beginning. Um, can evolution in a constant environment continue forever without slowing? Okay. So this is a thing which we're going to address from uh, theoretical um, considerations um, uh, today and make some about whether or not we should expect this or not expect this. And therefore, is it something which is intrinsically surprising or something which is not so, um, uh, not so surprising? So I want to, um, before going into that, I really want to sort of think about the sense in which I mean by high dimensional, um, um, high dimensional biology. So if I think of within the, uh, um, um, within the cell, then we've got what we could call the, um, the nano phenotype. So the nano phenotype, which is the properties of all the proteins and how the proteins bind to DNA and so on. Okay, and that's some very high um, uh, dimension. Um, a very high dimension, you know, at least tens of thousands, even for a simple uh, um, cell and already substantial for, um, for a bacteria. So that's the sort of dimension of the phenotype. That's all the different ways in which the organism can change. Now, of course, that's driven by the changes in the genotype, but the change in the genotype is something which doesn't directly couple to the environment or to the properties. So we're gonna want to work entirely in terms of the phenotype in order to try to understand what goes on. And then of course, one can try to connect that to the genotype, um, uh, genotype as well. So then this nanophenotype, um, this codes for the organismic phenotype, which is still something very high dimensional. It's the way, all the ways in which it interacts with the environment, affects the environment, how it's affected by the environment, how it interacts with other organisms and so on. Okay, so we've got the organis organismic phenotype still very high um, um, dimensions, but the space in which the evolution is working is really of this nanophenotype. Um, of the, uh, the microscopic um, level of the, of the proteins. 
Okay. And then, of course, we've got the environmental. And the simplest way to think about this would just be, say, the number of chemicals which affect the, um, uh, affect the organism and the number of chemicals that with it can affect the organism. Now, as Daniel Segre um, um, just said in the, the question at the end of the talk, that if you took all, each cell and lysed the cell, and so all the chemicals in the cell came into the um, environment, which others could use or could be affected by, could be poisoned by, and so on, that's something which already is very, uh, um, um, is very complicated. That surely is going to give all kinds of roots for um, evolution, potential evolution, and is something um, which, um, unfortunately, no one seems to have really done that experiment carefully of the time to evolve in those uh, conditions. But the one thing we can be sure of is that the environment is very high dimensional, a very large number of chemicals, and the phenotype is very high dimensional. Okay. So what we want to, uh, um, uh, um, what I want to do is try to be motivated by, um, by this and think about the consequences of the, um, this high dimensional environment. Let's see. Um, make sure I've got, yeah, okay. Um, so I want to think about the consequences of this um, um, high, dimensional, um, high dimensional environment. So what we want to consider is organisms that you know already well adapted. They've been around for a long time, so we're not making artificial um, um, organisms usually. Okay, and so then we have to think about the fact that everything is conditioned on the evolutionary history. Okay, so the evolutionary history of the organisms, and of course that includes the history of the environment. What is that going to imply? Well, if they're already well adapted, that's going to imply any changes. So changes, which can be genetic changes or changes in the environment. Okay, genetic and environmental changes, their effects will be a sum of positive and negative parts. Okay, well, if you have a large number of positive and negative parts, why do I say that? Well, supposing those genetic chains always had positive contribution then it would already fix in the population, something which is universally, um, universally positive. So whether it's positive effects or negative effects will depend on the environment, it'll depend on the genetic background, the rest of the evolution that's occurred before. So this is something which we can generally expect as a consequence of the evolutionary history. Okay. So then we can take a, uh, um, a, just a sort of guess, well, if it's sort of some of positive and negative parts, it makes it very unpredictable, and this will give rise to something which we can try to approximate in a way approximating by some kind of randomness and then look at the consequences of, uh, um, of that. Okay, so this already, um, you've seen some of thinking about um, the interactions as being, as being complicated, they can sort of be effectively um, random, but I'm gonna really take that and try to run with it, uh, um, I'll run with it somewhat. Okay, so what is the, um, uh, the hope? Okay, well, the hope comes from the fact that we have high dimensions. Okay, so this, um, very general quote of Phil Anderson's, more is different, that when you've got a large number of things interacting together, there's something the general character of high dimensions, then things are different than you would expect from um, uh, looking at small numbers interacting, um, interacting together. Um, there are certain kinds of um, uh, behaviors. Um, some of the behavior is independent of um, uh, details. So we wanna know what the behaviors are that can, uh, um, uh, can occur. Behaviors in a loose general sense, what the possible um, things are that can um, uh, that can occur, and one of the things that we've learned from um, from physics is that not all the details are going to matter. So we can hope to get things from simple um, uh, models. So not all the details matter. Okay, in particular, we're interested in um, behaviors that are sort of robust. They don't depend upon all of the, um, the details. And that's a sort of loose term, and I'll say a bit what it means in some particular, um, um, uh, particular context. Okay? So we would like to try to get a robust, uh, um, um, uh, a robust understanding. Okay? So this really um, comes to the, the sort of goal of these, uh, um, of these talks. So what we're going to try to do is look at some very simple, um, uh, simple models, where a key feature is that they're high dimensional, and the interactions and things are complicated enough we can approximate those as being uh, um, random. And of course, we then have to go um, uh, to go beyond that. Okay. So those simple models, we want to then what can exist, what things can occur. Okay, now this doesn't mean that it applies in biology at all, or that it implies in ecology in any particular system, but it's asking what can occur. 
If we see something that can occur in a simple model, that suggests that seeing it in nature should not be surprising. Okay. Now we have to be a little careful there, and that's where this um, robust part comes in. If we can sort of argue that that can sort of robustly happen in sort of a class of models, a range of models, then um, we can say some more about, some, well, okay, that wouldn't be surprising if we saw that. We don't fully understand it, but we get some general um, uh, sense of it. Okay. Now this is in a, in a, in a context which is gonna be loosely, we can sort of think of phases, meaning phases like a um, solid or liquid or a superconductor. Um, so the analogy with phases, in, uh, um, in physics. And we would like to ask what kinds of phases can occur. Okay. And obviously we can't ask about that generally, but we're gonna talk about particular, um, I want to talk about particular examples. Okay, so that's the general, uh, um, uh, general uh, scope and sort of what the goal is going to, uh, um, to be. And now I'm gonna to go to some um, specifics. Um, but before I do that, maybe I can pause if there are any um, um, uh, questions on sort of where we can try to, um, uh, try to go. Okay, Antonio, can you just say something so I'm making sure I at least can hear? Sure, I can hear. Okay. Well, I don't think there was a question. So not questions at this point? No. Um, no okay. Um, oh, okay, there's one question just now. Oh, yes. Can you read that? Yes. Um, this is just to clarify, when you say what can occur, do you mean behaviors or patterns arising out of the nanophenotypes? So yes, I mean things that can come from the interaction between the nanophenotypes as manifested in the organismic phenotypes and the environment. And I'm what can you know, occur, um, like for example, do we expect extensive diversity with very large number of closely related strains that can, uh, um, uh, can coexist. Okay. And then also the question of things, can evolution continue forever if the environment is, uh, um, is constant? So that's, a, that's the kind of thing that um, um, I want, want, to be able to, want to be able to do. Okay, so we're gonna now consider an idealized, uh, um, an idealized system. And the system, we're gonna consider evolution in the phenotype space. Okay, so this is gonna be of all the properties of the organisms. And I'm gonna say this is D-dimensional, um, which like D was the dimension of the phenotype. I'm gonna drop the phenotype for now. And my phenotype then is going to be given by some, um, uh, characterized by some vector, which is all the D properties of the organisms that will, uh, um, will matter. Okay, and then I'm gonna make some things incredibly simple. I'm gonna make, there's just at any given time, there's just one strain, okay, no spatial structure, no spatial structure or variations in the in environment. Everything is mixed together. Everything can, um, competes with each other. And then my fitness, in that case, um, I can make um, uh, well-defined. It's just gonna be some function phi, which is gonna be a function of the phenotype and the environment. So this is a vector describing the environment. Okay, it's gonna be a function of the phenotype and environment. And this is just gonna be the relative growth rate. Now, I um, personally, I hate the word fitness. It seems like it's a singular term. It's usually used as the fitness. This is fitter than that, okay? Well, it's, even though it's two S's, it really is a very parallel quantity. And I've um, uh, considered trying to get into the literature, the idea of the, uh, the fit gnome. I hate the word no, things ending in ohm generally, but I think this is actually illustrative of um, the complexities going on. And because at the very least, even when the environment is fixed, of course, everything depends on the environment. If I change the environment, then things are going to uh, um, are going to change. Okay, so that's that's the um, quantity we've got. But we're going to fix the um, uh, um, uh, the environment at least for now. Okay, so then we get a small mutation, a small effect mutation, and that mutation will take x to x plus um, dx. And I'll try to do keep doing the vectors at least for a, for a while. I'll get lazy and um, I'll get lazy shortly. And then if the phi of x plus dx in this environment is bigger than phi of x. Okay, then that mutation fixes. So the mutation takes over, takes over. Okay. 
So what does this mean? It means that I can treat my dynamics as being approximately deterministic if the dx is, is, is very small, so that the evolution is now approximately deterministic. Okay, and where will it go? Well, it will just go uphill. So it just goes simply uphill in this fitness, um, uh, fitness landscape. Okay, so my dx dt, the way in which it changes with evolution, okay, that's just gonna be the gradient with respect to x, so the gradient with respect to x of the phi. I'm fixing the environment, and so that's uh, um, that's not changing. So I've got a very simple thing, and then of course, if we're doing this with the fixing the environment, then this this phi is just the uh, um, uh, the landscape um, uh, that I've got. This is really evolution in a continuous landscape. This is the simplest um, um, uh, simplest possible um, uh, a possible model. Okay, so then of course things are uh, um, trivial, or at least seem to be um, trivial. Okay, so I can of course draw the behavior in the case where um, dimensions are two. Some people can draw things in three dimensions. I can't. Um, and so what I've drawn here is contours of the uh, um, um, of the landscape. So these are contours of, uh, of phi. And then in those contours, I will get uh, um, uh, get dynamics. So if I start at some point, uh, um, if I start at some point here, I'll come uh, um, uh, come up I'm here. I'm going up the gradient, so I'll bend around like this, and I'll come to a fitness uh, um, uh, fitness maximum. So I'm going to go up like that. Of course, if I started over here, then I'll come up like this. I'll come up here and go over to this um, uh, maximum. If I came here, I would come up and go um, and by mistake erase my contours, which is cheating, and I would go over um, in this way there. Okay, so here I've got two possible uh, maxima, and these are separated by a, a saddle, which is sort of the decision, um, the decision point of what goes on. And depending on whether the saddle, it comes to one side of that or to the, uh, um, or to the other, then it will go to one of these uh, maxima or not. And of course I can have many maxima, but the thing which we know is that at uh, um, long times, as we get long times, the evolution will go to one of the maxima. Okay. Um, there was a question when I say relative growth rate, what is it relative to? Is genetic drift important? So the first one, what I mean is that it's growing faster. It's higher fitness will mean it grows faster to something with lower fitness. Okay, so the things that the only the things that really matter are the fitness um, differences. So it's really say the difference between this fitness and this fitness that matters. That means this will grow faster and will take over. Okay, I'm going to ignore genetic drift. One can consider the effects of genetic drift if we're in bacterial populations, particularly say if they live in the ocean. The populations are very large. Drift is not very important, even though possibly of extinction is important. Okay, so that I'll talk about uh, um, um, next time. So this is the behavior in two dimensions and the general assumption and the way in which most talk about um, evolution in you know, simple conditions goes is that there are some number of fitness maxima and long times you go towards the, uh, um, towards the maxima. So the question is that what, is that what really happens? Okay, so we're now gonna want to consider things going in, in higher dimensions, but let me first show a bit of the, the behavior that complex is gonna happen in, in, uh, um, in two dimensions. So in two dimensions, I can look at all of the, the stationary points, all of the points at which the, there's no, um, uh, no dynamics. So those are the points at which uh, um, x um, uh, dx dt is equal to zero. So those stationary points, they can be maxima as I've already um, shown, there's a maxima. Um, they can be saddles like this one here, or they can be saddles of index two. And the index of these points is just the number of the unstable eigenvalues. So a, a maxima is, is zero, and a uh, um, um, one which is a minimum, this is the minimum in two dimensions is two, and the intermediate one is one. Okay. Now, if we go to, um, uh, to high dimensions, so we now go to high D or general D. Okay. So then we can get all possible indices, all possible indices of the uh, um, uh, saddles from uh, I equals zero, which will be a maxima all the way up to, um, to D. And of course the expectation would, would be that one would go towards these maxima at, uh, um, um, at long times. Okay, now what am I gonna consider? What kind of landscapes I'm, I'm gonna consider? I'm gonna consider landscapes where they have lots of maxima. It's gonna be the complexities of the, um, of the, bi the biology, the complexity of the evolutionary history, the evolutionary constraints and so on. I'm gonna assume that phi is a complex, some complex landscape, okay? 
and I'm approximate this in some random landscape and I'll be specific about it, examples shortly, approximate this as random with some um, statistics. Okay, so this is meaning that the number of extrema, um, this is the number of stationary points, sorry, I was calling that, number of stationary points goes exponentially with the, um, uh, with the dimension and that coefficient then will depend on I. If I look at the number with a given index, the exponential and dimension and all possible indices will occur. Generally, the maximums will occur at higher phi and the minimum will occur at lower phi. But of course I can have local maxima and local minima which occur at intermediate, intermediate values. Okay, so one of the general features which is known from some mechanics is you'll get exponentially many um, uh, maxima and uh, minimum so on. So, okay, one well, would we'll still expect that the behavior would go to the, uh, um, uh, towards one of the uh, maxima. Okay, so what actually happens? What happens in the limit of uh, um, high B is if we look as a function of time, so we can look as a function of time, okay, if we look as a function of time and we can look at the phi, so what happens is initially phi will go, um, uh, will go up fast, then phi will go along and it'll saturate. So it'll go very slowly, very slowly upwards. So that's, uh, um, uh, that's phi. Okay, I can look at the index. I can look at the index um, coming, um, uh, coming here. The index will start out being, uh, um, being of order d over two and the index will gradually come, um, uh, come down. Okay, and what happens here is that the behavior is that it wanders around the saddles. So it wanders around the saddles, all the saddles. It's generally getting to lower and lower index saddle, meaning they're getting closer to maximum, but they always have some um, unstable directions. And the crucial part here is that it never, never in the limit of infinite D commits to a maximum. Okay. So there is no sense in the limit of very high dimensions that it approaches a maximum. It always keeps wandering around the, um, the wandering around the saddles. It's as if in two dimensions, which of course I can't get this, it went, it came from this saddle, it wandered that saddle, it wandered to another saddle um, um, after that, wandered over here, went to some other saddle and so on, and just kept wandering around the saddles. And of course it can't do that in, in two dimensions, but in high dimensions it can do that. And that's the generic behavior. So this is the generic behavior that happens in, uh, um, um, in high dimensional complex landscapes. This is the generic behavior. It's robust under a specific assumptions about what the dynamics, uh, um, uh, what, the landscape, um, what the landscape looks like. Okay. So that's already a surprise is that one's intuition about low dimensions is wrong when it comes to uh, um, high dimensions. Okay, so here the evolution continues forever. It doesn't commit to a saddle, but it still slows down, right? So it's definitely still uh, um, uh, slowing down here, right? The fitness is going up uh, um, slowly. The index is going um, um, uh, down slowly. If I think in terms of the mutations, the mutations will fix less and less often. It's harder and harder to find the, um, uh, find the mutations. So the evolution will slow down. Okay. So of course, not surprisingly, the answer to my question of whether evolution can continue forever without slowing down is no in a constant environment. But now what we have to do is we have to add in the ecology. Okay. So we have to add in a little bit of ecology. Okay. What does that mean? Well, any organism changes its environment, okay? So if you have uh, phenotype X, so that's the whole population, it's just one strain, right, with phenotype X. What that will do It'll take the environment to being an environment will be equal to some in some function of that phenotype of the organism which is there and the external conditions, the things that you're holding fixed. Okay, so these you're holding fixed in the experiment, but you can't hold fixed the effects of the organism because, of course, if the organism mutates, if X changes, then it will uh, um, um, change. Okay, so it's simple then to think in terms of the fitness of the organism when it's um, uh, the fitness as a function of X. Okay, so that's a function of phenotype. Okay, and then it's going to be the E, which is this E here. So it's now going to be E um, given by Y. Okay, and then um, this I'm going to call a different, uh, um, uh, different quantity. I'm just going to call it Psi 
of x and y. Okay, and this x here, this is the resident organism. It's the one that controls the environment. Right? This is the one that controls the environment. And this one can be any. So any other organism that comes in can have this fitness. If this is larger than the resident, right? So if this is larger than the resident, the fitness, then the, um, that can invade and come in. So again, I, I look at a mutant. Okay, so I start off with x equal to, uh, um, uh, to y. It's just there. But then I look at a mutant, which is x plus dx. And I ask if, the, if this is higher. So if psi, if psi x plus dx and this fixed and y, okay, is greater than psi at x and uh, y. And of course, this is at y equal to x. Right, this is at y equal to x, it's the resident that's there, then it invades, then it comes in, and this takes over. Okay, and my environment changes and my fitness changes. So it takes over, the environment now goes to, I get now the environment becomes E of this x plus um, dx. Okay, so what does that imply? That implies that the, um, that the dynamics the dynamics is now going to be driven by the um, um, by these changes, and so the dynamics is dx dt. This is now the evolution. It is dx dt is going to be gradient with respect to x of psi at x and y, but I evaluate that at y equal to x, right? Because that's the thing that's already there. Okay, so that's going to be my, um, uh, uh, my dynamics. And um, this is my, my um, uh, uh, dynamics here. Um, the, um, put that in red, that's my dynamics, okay? Now, an important thing about, uh, about this is this is not gradient flow, okay? So this dynamics here is not gradient flow. It doesn't just go uphill. Okay. If you like um, the physics thing, you can think of it has some curls to it. It doesn't, it doesn't intrinsically take psi up. What it does is it takes psi up at fixed um, a value here, right? So it's increasing here. The fitness is going, uh, um, the fitness is going up, but then that'll change it. So it's then going up a different way. Okay. So now what this is going to um, uh, look like, let's move, move this. Um, okay. Oh, damn. Ah, that was not working. Um, um, okay, so let me look at what um, happens here. I get flows coming around a uh, um, uh, around a saddle. So if I if I, for example, have my flow here, so now I'm fit sitting at fixed um, uh, at fixed phi. I now say get a flow which comes like this. So I'm starting getting a flow. It starts gets gets near the saddle. It has to decide, right? So it bends over in this uh, um, um, this direction because it's that side of the saddle. Okay, but now what can happen, of course, is the environment can change. As it's going along, the environment is uh, um, uh, changing. So if I do this um, uh, correctly, uh, if I do this correctly, my environment is now changing. So my environment changes here. My saddle has moved. Okay, I'm doing it, of course, as a discrete step there. It isn't really a discrete step, it's continuous. So what does that mean? That means that this now goes a different direction. Okay, so the environment changes can qualitatively change where it, uh, um, um, uh, where it goes. Okay. So I've got my environment change as it's evolving, driven by the evolution. Okay, gives you qualitative changes. You go in different directions. So this is a picture in, in two dimensions. Again, I can't do things. They don't get very interesting because I've only got a small number of um, a maximum that I can go to and so on. Okay, so there's a question. Um, did we assume separate time scales for the ecology evolution? Ah, thank you very much. Okay, I should have certainly said that. Um, we're assuming all the way through um, uh, through this, um, and I should have said it right, uh, um, um, right at the beginning, is that the, the evolution is very uh, um, slow. Um, Evo um, is very slow. Okay, and the environmental changes are fast. Um, with the evolution of fast. This means evolution slow in the sense of rare mutations. Only one mutation is coming in at a time. OK, 
Okay. And the crucial bit here is this idealized, the fact that I said it's always one strain. It's one strain except in transient when I get a new mutation uh, um, uh, coming in. Yeah, thanks for that um, question. Okay. So what we want to ask is what will happen in high dimensions. We've now got something which is more complicated than this, because as we're going up here in phi, then the whole function is changing. So I'm going up somewhere, um, uh, somewhere different. Okay, so we want to ask what, uh, um, uh, what happens when we've got uh, um, this. Okay, so what happens if we're in high um, dimension? In particular, we would ask, like to ask what happens with minimal ecology. Okay, so what is the minimal ecology meaning? I'm going to put small, small changes in eco, small changes in the environment, in the uh, um, environment. Okay, and the specific thing that's going to mean is that if I look at the sort of scale of the gradients with respect to x of psi, so this is the change with the phenotype, okay, this is going to be much, much larger than the typical um, scale of the gradients with respect to y of the psi. Okay, so this was the environment part, change, environmental change, and this was the phenotypic change. Okay. And in particular, I can make a ratio between these. So I'm going to say this is much, uh, um, uh, much bigger. Um, this is going to be, oops, um, um, uh, this is going to be here, say, of order um, uh, uh, some uh, uh, parameter here, which I'm going to call delta. Okay, so it's going to be of order that, where I'm going to be considering delta much less than one. So what I want to ask is I want to ask a minimal effect, minimal effect of ecological changes. And I want to ask what happens with delta small, okay? Well, in this two-dimensional example, it's clear what happens when, the, um, when delta is small. If delta is small, then the amount that I'm gonna move the saddle by as this comes up is gonna be very small. So only if it was extremely close initially, if it was extremely close initially and this changes a bit, will it go in a different direction? Okay, so here it can change it. It'll make little changes where it goes, but not much. Okay, so I think this is again, the sort of conventional view. Okay, of course they change the environment, particularly bacteria. They're gonna change it by a little bit, but it's not gonna be very, uh, um, uh, not gonna be very interesting. Okay, so what will happen if in, in high dimensions? Okay. So what happens is that there the phase that comes in, I'm going to call red queen phase, And this red queen phase occurs for any arbitrarily small delta. Um, this occurs for any, any delta, no matter how small, in the limit of d to infinity. In the high dimensions, any delta will change it. Any delta will make it that I have the following, um, uh, following behavior. If I again plot things versus time on these evolutionary, um, evolutionary time scales, Okay, so if I look at the psi, which is the fitness, so I'm gonna look at the psi, what, how, that, uh, um, um, how that behaves, this, the, this will come up, it'll come up, come up, slow down, get slower and slower. Then it'll roughly saturate. Now, if this saturates, you can say, wait a minute, that means the evolution stopped. But no, it doesn't, because evolution is keeping going because the environment is changing, even though the overall fitness is staying, uh, um, um, is staying the same. So the fitness, of course, now is not really well defined since the environment is changing, but this quantity, which I've defined the, the psi, is staying the, uh, um, roughly the same. Okay. Now we can ask how far is it, uh, um, how far has it got? Okay, so we can draw a line up here. Okay, and this is the line of the typical maxima, the fitness at which I would find the maxima as a function of psi, a, a function of x. Okay, so if I fix the environment, I would find the uh, um, I find some maxima, and it's not getting to that. There's some gap there. So there's some gap as to where it uh, um, uh, gets to. There's a little gap uh, um, uh, gap here. Okay, there's a little gap there, and this gap is going to be proportional to some power of uh, um, uh, some power of delta. Okay, the smaller delta is, the closer it gets, but the um, it never quite gets to where the maxima. Are. So this is really going to be very much is the wandering around the saddles. Okay, how could I see that? Um, um, how can I see that? Well, I could plot the, the index. So I can plot the index here. The index, the index will come down and saturate. So this is now the index. 
So this means I'm getting closer to settles. If this was zero, every maxima, and this will saturate at a value here, which goes as some other power of uh, um, um, uh, delta. So it doesn't go to zero. So this is where i goes to i goes to um, um, i goes to infinity. Okay. If I'm more precise as to what I meant by over here, I meant that the, um, the psi will go to um, uh, so psi at infinity will be um, approximately the psi at which the maxima, I first find maxima, first find maxima minus something which is delta v alpha. Okay, so I'm never seeing the maxima at all. I'm just keeping wandering around. And what this behavior is, it's deterministic chaos. So this behavior is that I get deterministic chaos. It's deterministic because I'm assuming no stochasticity. I'm just going uphill, but uphill in this weird way of uphill in this gradually changing environment. Okay. So of course the effects of small delta in the limit of small delta, this effects is small. It's gonna get very close to this. It's gonna slow down. So if I look at the typical size of the, um, uh, the dx dt, if I look at the dx dt, typical magnitude of it with the evolution, this typical magnitude is gonna go to zero and it'll go as, uh, um, as t goes to infinity, um, as t goes to infinity, this will go as delta to some other power, um, um, some other power gamma. Okay. And you can work out what those um, uh, what those powers are in the in the concrete example, which I'm now going to uh, um, show. Okay, so this is all very abstract. So I, this is, but however, it's the result of at least semi-honest um, uh, calculations. And so I want to at least say what the model is, which will give this. Okay, but the claim is that this is going to be very robust. There's a whole class of models that will uh, um, um, will give this behavior. Okay, so I'm now going to write down as a concrete uh, um, uh, concrete model. Okay. For convenience, it's convenient to put the um, x's on a sphere, um, a hypersphere with x um, squared, so equal to d. That gives you high symmetry and you can do various um, an analytical, um, analytical things. And a lot is known about such landscapes, random landscapes on spheres, but where it's a fixed landscape. Okay, so a lot is known about, uh, um, about that and all kinds of things about the statistics of the landscapes and the uphill dynamics on that landscape. The effects of fluctuations, temperature or fluctuations like drift are, uh, um, um, are known. Okay, so I'm gonna now write down a particular um, a model. I'm gonna write down my psi. This is going to be a sum of all of the, um, uh, all of the components. So my vector x has now components um, uh, xi with i equals one to d and this is some um, uh, j, i, j, k, x, i, x, j, x, k. So that's my landscape in the absence of the ecological um, uh, feedback. And the j are i, i, d, Gaussian, they're independent um, Gaussian, um, uh, Gaussian variables um, uh, with some variance um, would mean, mean zero. Okay, so that's my, that's my landscape. It's a simple form of a complex landscape and is known to be one of the generic classes of landscape. But now I'm going to add a part to uh, um, uh, to this. Um, I'm going to add a part here, okay, um, uh, plus a part here, which is now going to have my parameter delta in front of it. It's going to be small um, plus delta, and now I'm going to put again the sum on the i, j, and k of some other set of random variables um, i, j, k. And this, is, of course, is going to depend on the x. That's the way it depends on the um, um, on the phenotype, okay? But then it's going to have, instead of the um, uh, x coming in there, it's going to have y, k, okay? So this is the way it depends on the environment. That's the way it depends on the environment, okay? And my w's are also um, um, uh, 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 IID Gaussian, okay? So I've got a Gaussian random, um, uh, random potential on the sphere, the random landscape coming from this part, and then I'm putting a modification that comes from this, which depends on the, um, on the environment, okay? And then what is, my, um, uh, what is my dynamics? My dynamics is that dx i dt, I've got one component of it, and i t is d by d x i, psi, okay? Evaluated, it's evaluated at y equals to x, right? That's the environment that's there. It's now changing, coming from the mutations, right? So this is the evolutionary dynamics on this landscape. 
to evaluate it there. And then I need a, a piece which has a, a Lagrange multiplier to keep the, um, uh, this bit keeps the, keeps it on the sphere. Technical term. Um, okay, so this is my um, this is my dynamics, and then this is a model which one can analyze by methods I'm going to talk about tomorrow. So this is analyzed by methods for dynamical mean field theory. Um, damn. Oh, what oh, the hell? Um, sorry about that. Okay, um, dynamical um, uh, mean field theory, and I'm going to talk about how to do that um, tomorrow. It's analogous to things done for spin glasses for those of you um, who are familiar with uh, that. And I said, I'm gonna explain it, um, explain it tomorrow. Okay, so this is where the source of these, uh, um, these predictions, the source of these, uh, um, um, these understandings. Um, and the one thing which we know from analysis of this is the kinds of behavior. So particularly the phase, this red queen phase is generic. You can meaning, you can change the form, you can make this having you know, cortic terms, you can put other things in here, and the small other changes won't change the, um, uh, change the behavior. And this is really then in the sense of the physics is like a generic phase. Okay. I should mention, why am I calling it red queen? It's red queen because the, um, um, you have to keep going, running very fast just to stay still. You have to keep up with the changes in the environment by, uh, um, uh, by changing. Um, and that's what driving the evolution. And with delta small, you don't have to go very fast. It's not very red queen, but it's um, always have to keep racing and never really getting anywhere. So there's no sense in which is an overall improvement. Statistically, you can't tell the difference between whether you're at this time or whether you have much longer times. Once you've got these initial transients, things will saturate and it'll get to a statistical um, steady state out here at long, uh, um, at long time. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so the question is, was the saturation of psi over long times on, uh, on average? Um, well, this is one of the advantages of high dimensions. It is a bit like thermodynamics, is the quantities will fluctuate, but the quantities will fluctuate by something which is much less than the amount in which they're average. So this will go to essentially a constant amount. It'll have fluctuations of relative magnitude, something like one over square root of D coming around this. That'll depend on delta as well. Okay, so it won't, it will, it will saturate roughly. The index will come around. The index will also um, fluctuate uh, um, around a little bit, but not by, uh, um, um, not by much. Okay, and this is the big advantage of the large um, dimensions, or one of the big advantages um, for doing it. The other is the ability to use these, uh, um, um, these methods. Okay. Okay, so what I just want to, um, I'm going to say, I'm going to explain how you do those kinds of problems a bit tomorrow, but what I want to do um, um, uh, today is just ask some questions and extensions okay, about this. Okay. So one question is, is there also um, a phase with different random potential without red queen, meaning that um, phi slows, um, everything slows down. Um, um, it always just keeps slowing down. Um, everything just keeps slowing down. So that's one um, possibility. I think I know the answer to this, but I'm not sure. Um, that's one, one possibility. Um, the other, another one is if I'm in a simple environment, to the extent that that exists, simple environment. So there I would sort of think, well, in some sense, there's not going to be very many peaks. So there's a modest number of peaks, or at least fewer peaks. Okay. But I have a lot of eco evolutionary constraints on how Y can change. In other words, it can only go in certain um, directions. Whether it can go in one direction or not will depend on where it's gone before. So that'll introduce what's like the saddles and will introduce something which has a large number of possible places that it could get to, even though they're the phenotypically sort of the same, there's fewer peaks in the organismic phenotype type, but in the level of the nanophenotype here, the changes are constrained, different changes could have similar effects, 
And so I could change in this way, or I could change in that way, there's similar effects, but a way say in between, this way I'm changing like that, this would be forbidden by the, um, by the constraints. Okay, so I'd have a large number of constraints. And so I would like to ask what happens if I have a large number of constraints. So there are many of these, um, many of these, and particular action would like to ask about what happens if there are order D constraints. Okay, then we want to analyze some things as well. And again, I have some sense of what then happens, but not uh, um, um, don't, certainly don't fully understand. Okay, and the last one and the most important one is about diversification. Okay. In particular, I can get what's called evolutionary branching. Oh, and I should mention this whole framework. Um, this whole framework is, is called adaptive dynamics. This framework of where the environment changes due to the um, evolution, and particularly Michael um, Dobley. Um, is it Dobley? Uh, Michael Dobley has an enormous amount of work on this, including finding chaos in some models of low dimensions. They doing it numerically primarily, so can't do high dimensions. But one of the important phenomena is that happens is you can get this evolutionary branching. Um, so say I've got some, uh, um, um, again, I've got some, um, uh, some saddle um, in the, um, um, here, and I'm coming along. And so my, I'm coming along here, and I'm coming along, say, getting near the saddle. Okay, but then I get a mutant. My mutant can go over to here. My mutant is now not infinitesimal. Okay, so this mutant then can go off in another direction. It comes here. It'll go off, say, another direction, another direction. This uh, um, this will go this way, and these can coexist. So these two then can coexist. So now I've got two types. Okay. And the system will be, quite generically, will tend to be unstable to this, to this, to this branching. Meaning it'll be unstable to having coexisting types. Okay. So the question here is if we ask, what is the question? Can you get large number of types, strains coexisting? Now, of course, some will go extinct. Other ones will be they'll be driven extinct deterministically. Other ones will um, branch. And so you could get a continuing turnover from, uh, um, from this. And this is, I think, the most interesting question as to whether or not this can occur. Because that starts bringing together the questions about the, the evolution and the um, ecology. So I don't know what the answer to this is. Possibly you could get maybe order D um, uh, different strains. Um, um, uh, that would be, I think, one of the most interesting um, um, interesting possibilities. Um, this I don't know. I have some some thoughts on it, but not very uh, um, um, uh, not very advanced. Okay. This I'm going to talk about now tomorrow. This I'm going to talk about tomorrow in the general question of many strains uh, coexisting, not in this framework, but in in back lot of Altera one, and then come back to this sort of question at the uh, um, at the end of, of um, on uh, on Friday. So the main um, uh, messages here is that evolution in high dimensions is very different than in low dimensions. Okay, it's very different than one's intuition. In particular, that any small amount of ecological feedback, any small amount of that will make the evolution continue forever. So in some sense, if evolution does continue forever, even in a simple environment, we shouldn't be too surprised. Okay. So I'm gonna um, say stop there and take uh, um, uh, take questions. And sorry, I suspect I've gone on a bit longer than um, longer than I should have already. So questions. We're waiting for questions. Yeah, if you want to unmute and ask the questions directly. Um... Can I make a comment? Hello. Dan yes. Hello, hello, Daniel. Thank you for very much. Hi, Mercedes. Hi. Very interesting to try to understand you. I think there is a fascinating question, which is um, when you get this interaction of ecology and evolution, um, how, how does the, uh, the same evolutionary forces that have to do with coexistence yes. of the organismal phenotypes will determine 
the dimensions of the nanophenotype. So how big right. is the, var the variation, right. the pool of variation from which you assemble the high coexistence right. at the higher level? I think right. those things are connected. And the way they are connected may be super important for thresholds for, uh, that we may cross when we set up conditions where we lose the capacity of keeping a diverse nanophenotype. So yes. I think this is a fascinating question. Uh, I think where you have hyperdiverse systems in biology, evolution over long times and large space has set up a very high dimensional nanophenotype. Yes. But that's not yes. by chance. And I think yes. understanding okay. that connection yes. is critical yeah. to maintaining diversity. So that, that's, that's a great point, or, or I guess many great points in there. So most of the interesting properties of environment that an organism feels are, are properties made by the rest of the biology. And so they say the simple example, when you take a cell, which is complex, you lyse it, you've got all those chemicals in it, all kinds of uh, potential. Of course, with geographical structure, the biology will also set up gradients, set up different conditions, and you'll get the development of the of the all the further complexities which enable the much more evolution and more um, diversification. Okay. So the way I want to sort of try to ask that is, is that something which is sort of we should expect that once the biology has got complicated enough, okay, much less complicated than it is now, once it's got complicated enough, do we generally expect that one will get in this state or this phase of continuing um, diversification, the environment in some sense continue to get complex um, as well. But even if we sort of saturate how complex the environment is, you know, bacteria are not that much more com complex now than they were a billion years ago, and we can still have everything continuing once we get to such a state. Okay? But there there's a question, as you say, about sort of threshold, as so some threshold will have to go over where this sort of picture might start to apply. Okay. Yeah, in I, particular, I, I, there's in some of the parameters which I which I had um, here. Of course, D isn't infinite; it's large. For any finite D, there's a there's a delta. But if it's not big enough, if you don't give enough feedback, then things will just slow down and you'll go to a maximum. Okay, so you sort of need the D to be big enough to get this going. And then the question is, once it gets going, does it sort of continue? And should we be you know, be surprised that it uh, um, that it continues? I'm going to say a little bit tomorrow about thresholds in for diversification in Lock Gibraltarra, um, um, a Lock Gibraltarra models in you know, absolute simplest um, situation. Again, I don't know whether any of this has anything directly to do with the, um, uh, the biology. It's really the goal is to sort of make some conceptual things and give them some, you know, sort of mathematical um, a footing in the sense of knowing this is something which could happen with sufficient uh, um, um, complexity. But a really interesting question, and to some extent, uh, maybe I make some com comments on this Friday, is that one can ask if you start with something which is not very complex and get the complexities added by the, um, as the evolution occurs, can you sort of get into some kind of um, high, diverse, uh, um, high diverse state? Yeah, I'll give an example tomorrow, perhaps uh, in the malaria case, under very high transmission of the existence of such threshold. It may be of interest. Ah, great. Well, so I was going to make a point. I listened to your lecture yesterday and really enjoyed it. And I was going to make a point of listening to it tomorrow. And one of the advantages of doing oh, things on whiteboard rather than slides is I can modify in real time things based on the other. Uh, just, on the just other, to, to know other that there is a connection and I'd be interested in yeah. that connection. Yeah. So I think these are good questions, I guess, for, for the roundtable um, next next week also. So yes. Are there, are there some um, yeah, questions from... Students or postdocs? And... Yes. Okay. Um, from Roberto, is it physically reasonable to think about a rotating saddle environment like the electric field in a pull trap for ions so that X is trapped in periodic dynamics? Ah, okay. So that's interesting. So one of the things that um, Michael um, uh, Dobley and collaborators um, find is that you can get things in these kinds of conditions where you get, um, you actually do get, you get a limit cycle. You get some rotating around as it's going around it changes the environment and it just goes on a cycle you can also get where it branches you can get where it branches and you have two of them going on uh, both going on cycles so something like this this would go on a cycle this would go on uh, um, on a cycle and they'd go around and do that uh, um, together so you definitely can get cycles generally and i'll say something about this tomorrow 
generally in high dimensions, cycles tend to be sort of unstable. You generally tend to have either sort of static things or chaos. Okay, and so in simple situations, you can get cycles, but you probably, if you go for a while, one of the organisms will find a way to sort of get out of that um, by doing something different, and it'll go off in that, uh, um, in that direction. Um, other, other questions? So when you show the, um, you have these uh, plots of the, the index saturating, uh, the index of the of fixed point saturating at some yes. low value. So yeah. are these are these saturations usually um, like do they happen fast or is there some time scale like uh, exponential? Well, okay, so there's a time scale. So there's a time scale associated with this. Okay, so there's a time scale associated with this coming down and this going up, depending you know, on initial conditions. So if you thought of going into a new environment, externally controlled environment, then initially it wouldn't be very fit. You would get you would go up here. This would be pretty much independent of delta. It's small changes. You're just doing better in that environment. But these small ecological changes, and they would only really start to matter when you'd sort of got near to what would be maxima in that environment that wasn't changing. Okay. So there's a time scale associated with this, which is just sort of basic time scales in the, in, the, in the model. When you go out over here, you don't converge this exponentially, you converge this as a power law. So you converge this power law convergence towards, uh, um, uh, towards these at this end. Um, and so you get, you get slow convergence. And that's even, that's the case also, if you look at the slowing down here, there's sort of a power law slowing down rather than exponential, um, exponential slowing down. Okay, but there are characteristic uh, scales. I've sort of set them all to one to make life, uh, um, um, uh, to make life simpler. So, so does that imply that if you could, uh, so is the rate at which new mutations fix would also go down? As a power law, I guess is that. Uh... Yeah. So this is so this is the rate of which is this is this is in fact this is I should have written it down. This is the rate of mutations fixing okay so that'll go um uh, that'll go down and how big the effects of those mutations are so how fast they fix will also will also go down but it won't continue to go down right as you go towards for infinite for infinite times, this will still, um, um, uh, this won't slow down completely. It'll keep going at some rate, depends on delta. If we turned off the ecological feedback, it would just get slower and slower. Okay, thank you. So maybe I have a question. Hi, Daniel. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry, I lost the beginning of your lecture. So probably you already addressed this, but uh, so the question is, uh, uh, this is based on deterministic picture of the dy dynamics, if I understand. Right. So, uh, are you thinking uh, uh, about so? As a, and the question is, what is the effect of uh, a noise on this? So, are you thinking uh, in your species? I mean, a quasi species uh, picture where um, essentially um, your variables are uh, robust with respect to noise, or uh, so how does uh, well, so I'm not, I'm, for now, today, I'm not talking about quasi species because at any given time I have one strain and then a mutant comes in and the mutant can take over. So I have two strains temporarily. So I only have one strain at a time, okay? Certainly you, the fluctuations will be demographic fluctuations. There'll be fluctuations in the mutations and particularly this thing I showed here about the evolutionary branching, this mutation actually has to occur some distance away. It can't be infinitesimal. Otherwise you don't get this. So it occurs some small distance away. So that's a stochasticity associated with the mutation. So any stochasticity will just add to it looking more chaotic, right? If it's deterministically chaotic, then a bit of stochasticity just sort of adds to that. If it's not chaotic, so if I'm in a situation like I get in, uh, um, in two dimensions or in low dimensions, where I have a small number of uh, um, small numbers of maxima and I go, um, I'll just go to those and determine by the settles, then when I get near a saddle, of course, the fluctuations will be important. And so which direction I go here will depend on the, uh, um, on the mutation. Okay. So there's an analogy with, uh, about evolution, which I give when giving talks to, to um, physics um, um, audience or general ones, um, which is um, the analogy is of a um, qualifying exam in, in physics in which some departments, it's traditional to ask one general uh, um, question or sometimes even a thesis defense. And the professor asked the student, um, how do you measure the height of a building with a barometer? 
So the student answered, I throw it off the roof and measure how long it takes to get to the ground. So he was failed on that part, but the professor realized that was kind of unfair. So he asked one of his colleagues to re-examine the student and she did, and she wrote the story down. So it's actually based on a true story. I'm sure it's been embellished. So she asked him, well, how, how, what other way would you do it? She said, I would go up the stairs and use it as a ruler and measure the height of the building. She goes, what if you didn't have access to the building? She goes, well, then I would measure the, um, the shadow of the barometer and the shadow of the building, and I would get the height from that. So she said, what about something that uses more interesting physics? So he said, I would make a very good pendulum with the barometer, and I would measure the period of the pendulum on the ground, the period of pendulum on the top of the building, and being able to get its height from the change in, in gravity from the bottom to the top. She goes, what about something that uses its value as a barometer? So he says, well, I would go to the superintendent of the building, and I would say to him, if I give you this really nice barometer, I'll give you this very nice barometer if you tell me how tall the building is. So at that point, the professor said, uh, you know, you, you pass. And as they were leaving the room, she goes, but surely you know what the right answer is. And he says, well, I know what answer you want, but I see no reason that I should give it. And I would say all of the lessons from evolution experiments in the lab is that you try to select on one thing and the organisms do something different. The very first chemostat experiments, as Leo, Leo Zillard, um, or early ones, where he was trying to select on faster growth rate, the bacteria were getting all flushed out. What did they do? They evolved to stick to the walls instead. They just played a different game. Okay, so this enormous number of possibilities, and I think this relates, goes back to Mercedes' question, is if you think about the number of sort of possible ways in which organisms can do better in some conditions, that way is gets more and more, the more complicated the biology and the ecology, meaning how many other species and things are around, gets. Okay, so you so there's really there a uh, um, um, you get into the more and more possibilities. The stochasticity will will certainly be important. It'll change things in detail, but in big populations, the stochasticity doesn't have to change things intrinsically. Okay, and I think that's say related a bit to what I'll, I'll talk about uh, um, uh, tomorrow. We'll mostly talk about deterministic things, so we understand a little bit about um, um, putting in stochastic effects. So I'm, I'm a believer that for, you know, microbial populations, except possibly pathogens, in some extent, drift doesn't matter. Extinctions matter. Drift matters when you have only one of you, but uh, um, it doesn't, the, otherwise the, the effects of the drift are, are um, not very important. The stochasticity as far as mutations is certainly, um, um, certainly important, but even that, there are some aspects of it which don't, uh, um, don't have to be, um, such as say the statement that I got once, you know, you're over here, you will tend to go there, you're not so likely to jump all the way over to here, even though of course, small mutations can have big, um, uh, big effects. Um, I'm not, I don't think that really answered your question, but that was... That's... Well, um, yes, <laughs> thanks. So I said, tomorrow I'm gonna to be much more, much more concrete and deal and work through things with concrete models and so on, and um, be more precise about what the kind of questions and things that I ended with, um, ended with here. We have just one more question here. Some kind of traveling wave effects. So there's very interesting things and this, I will say something about as to what happens if you put in spatial structure. And so by spatial structure, I'm gonna mean the simplest possible. The external environment is the same everywhere. Things can move around or get you know, carried around and ask what the effects of that are, okay? And there are very big effects on, um, of that in some circumstances, they can sort of look like wave effects. But when you get lots of traveling waves, they tend to again get more chaotic, like in the ocean. And so there are um, again sort of chaotic things can um, uh, can dominate. But the the spatial um, traveling waves are certainly important. Waves in phenotype space. That's like a, a question that was asked previously about sort of cycles in the in the phenotype um, phenotype space. So all kinds of things are possible. Which things are sort of generic in the sense of not special to particular models. Um, that one has to get at, and that's really, you know, sort of deep methods in developed in physics in the last 50 years enable one to sort of think about that, to talk about which things are more generic. And again, I'm going to do example tomorrow with Lotka Volterra of some very interesting behavior that's completely non-generic, but I will use that to get some more to understanding of some more um, uh, generic, more robust um, behavior that shouldn't depend on all of the, all of the details. Um, a question, I imagine evolutionary branching in two or three dimensions as a possible spherical wave. I'm not sure I understand that. I think here there's a discrete number of strains at any time, 
And so it isn't that there's a whole sphere of them um, uh, branching out. It would be two, two points that would be um, uh, separating. And then, of course, one of them could branch again, and you can get, um, you can get more. You know, radiation, going in a new environment, um, completely new environment, you, you know, you can get a lot of radiation into different, uh, um, um, uh, into many different directions, um, um, you know, all, all happening you know, simultaneously. And of course, the um, mutations can be fast enough and things that you'll get a lot going on at, at once. Okay, so it appears that we don't have any further question. Uh, th thanks very much, Daniel, for yeah. the beautiful. And if you have further questions or you want clarifications of things that come up overnight, then please, uh, um, please email me, and I'll try to address those. Um, well, I probably generally um, uh, tomorrow. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, and see you all tomorrow for uh, a new session. Goodbye. Okay. Hola, Armun. Ciao. Oh, perdón. I just saw that. I just saw you. Oh, we are still there. So I don't know why you appear in my screen. <laughs> People are still there. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving right now. Uh, okay. I'll, see you, I'll see you sometime. Well, Ciao. if you want to. Thank you. Ciao.